that whole experience has had lasting effects. Yeah. It it has set me up in my new role to I have a lot of trepidation. I I broke trust with myself by not listening to my gut that has never failed me. I allowed my ego and my pride to take over there because it was getting fed and I hurt myself very, very dearly. I'm Jim Hessler, and this is Path Forward, Real Conversations About Leadership. In every episode, we're having real conversations with real people about real issues, about the journey, about the challenges, about the joys. One thing leaders believe is that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the challenges, no matter how confusing or difficult things are, there's always a path forward. Leadership is a very creative process if you're doing it well. For the past 21 years, we've been teaching leadership primarily through the process of great conversations. Vicki is a senior executive in the tech industry, and she's had a long career. She's in a field that's historically male-dominated, and while she has a, a really impressive resume, one experience really stands out, and that's uh, the experience that she wants to talk with us about today. She had three, you know, really hard years in one job, and it, that shook her to her core and made her question everything she knows about her work and what she wants to get out of it and where her career is going. Vicki, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for uh, being our guest today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. 28 years in the same industry. Wow. Congratulations, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not so sure that that's warranted at this point. Yeah, I mean, for, yeah. Somebody, for somebody that doesn't work in tech, describe maybe how the, the, the leadership environment might be different than it might be in another industry. If you're not hands-on in the mire every day, you tend to become more distant from the tech and understanding everything in a you know very detailed fashion. If you get into a situation where you're like, gosh, I don't want to do this anymore. If you've been in leadership long enough, you're kind of stuck. Okay. So you, by advancing in the hierarchy, you maybe yes. tend to lose your skills a little bit. You lose the, the technical the current yes. skills. Yeah. Yeah. The current skills. Yeah. And it isn't that, you know, I mean, I go, I go and certify all the time in different things, but even then, if you're going to be a good leader, if that is the role you're going to do, it's going to take more time away from the right, hands on. Right. It started almost, you know, probably within a year of me going into leadership and things were changing and evolving since I wasn't hands-on as the, that evolution was happening. And then as I've gone up higher to where I now lead leaders, it's even more so. It isn't to say I don't bring a lot to the table <laughs> in that way, but depending on the company and the culture, I've been devalued in certain places and I've been really valued in others. So it, it's tricky space. Tell me about the devaluing. So where I've had issues is that if you go in, let's say you're hired into an organization and the person that's hiring you in is like, hey, we need your leadership. Like you have tons of enterprise level experience. We need you to come in. We have a ton of inexperienced tech engineers mm -hmm. and, you know, we need you to get processes, strategy, all of these things in place to move this team forward. But the culture of the organization has a lot of technical leadership because they've promoted within. Right, right. And so as you're working with different peers that may not be as, as strong in the leadership space, they can tend to devalue you as overall because you're not as technical as they are anymore. Mm. So it, it really can be, you know, per culture type of situation, somebody with great intent pulls somebody in that can tend to struggle. So there's a, a, a kind of a, a pecking order based on your technical knowledge? Is, is Oh, it... yeah. And really, depending on the culture, how you're treated as a result. Mm -hmm. I am a leader that you can drop in the absolute middle of chaos, and I will create structure, and I will create, you know, a very good path forward that is healthy and safe and Supports the business in a way that it needs to be supported. So 
somebody like me comes in and starts doing that, and then these other leaders that have kind of grown up through the organization are like, who is this person? And they can tend to look for things not like, hey, what's the great thing is, is she bringing? Here's what she's not bringing. Yeah, as you, as you look back on those kind of experiences where maybe you felt devalued or undervalued, is there anything that you would do differently if you, if you went back into some of those situations to do it over again? There was one whole experience where I wish I wouldn't have, have done it. I um, wouldn't have done it at all or would have done it differently? I would not have done it. No, wouldn't have done it at all. Mm. And it's something that will impact me for a long time. I interviewed with this company. I interviewed with them for a senior leader role I, for eight hours. And throughout that eight hours, I'm interviewing them just like they're interviewing me. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, I said, this is not a fit for me. I don't see a path to success for myself. I'm a great leader, but culturally here, I'm not going to fit. Like you guys don't want me. And you could tell that from eight hours of interviews. I could tell that. Mm-hmm. I, I looked at how people were showing up. I looked at, you know, through conversations with people that would be my close peers. I thought at the end of the day, I don't want to work with these people. And they are not culturally... I'm just not going to fit here. So let me guess. You took the job anyway. No. Yeah. So I I walked away. (laughs) I walked away. I told the recruiter and he had never had that happen before. And he's been a recruiter for 20 plus years. Yeah. And then the hiring director emailed me like a couple days later. He's like, what happened? So I very thoughtfully laid everything out for him. And I said, I just don't think it's a fit. And he's like, what you're saying is not a fit is exactly what we need. Like, that's why I want you. Right, right. And so he spoke to my pride. He spoke to my ego, Uh all of these things, (laughs) right? And my gut the whole time, Jim, is saying, don't do this. This is not good for you. Don't do this. And I did it. Mm. And then everything that I was concerned about within this company came to fruition within the first three months. Mm -hmm. And then it was a, a fight from the beginning to get anything done. And my peers that I was concerned about working with ended up being exactly the problem that I thought it would be. You have a bunch of engineers that are promoted into leadership, which is a huge problem in IT, that have zero emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. next to no self-awareness. My leader that I reported to was extremely difficult. So I tried to quit at the 10-month mark. (laughs) Okay. I'm like, yep, this, this, this didn't work. I, I, you know, lesson learned. Right. And so my boss brought in the SVP of the company to talk to me and talk me into staying. Are you sorry that you got talked into that? Or do you think? Yes, I am. Okay. So the next two years were an absolute nightmare. I was trying to hold on through February of 2022 because I was going to get a massive payout. Mm -hmm. And I ended up leaving three months early because it was so bad. And I was being treated so poorly that it just didn't go along with my personal values to stay there because of a large sum of money. Yeah. Okay. So treated you poorly. I'd like to, let's talk about what that looked like. Is, Mm -hmm. Is this an issue where you, your ideas got shut down. Is this an issue of, tr- were these issues of trust? So I was hired in under this one leader. He ended up leaving for contentious reasons. And I, I got shifted to another part of the organization that was considered less than. It devalued me to shift me over there. And I was worried about that change because here I'm trying to launch this program to fix this major issue for the organization. And I'm like, this is going to be a problem because I'm not going to be as valued. I'm not going to be able to get as much done. But I was trying to be a team player like, hey, all right, if you guys need this, I'm happy to do this and continue to to move on this. So they shifted me under another leader that didn't really have experience in my space. We didn't mesh very well. You know, I'm trying to get this program going. We get funded, we get defunded. We get a headcount here, it get pulled. So we couldn't move anything forward for two years, but we had everything planned and ready. And so when I say it wasn't treated well, I wasn't, I kept being told I needed to do this, but I wasn't enabled and empowered to do this. 
One of the most fundamental needs that we all have in the workplace and one of the most difficult things I think sometimes for leaders to provide is, is clarity. It's a, it's a word that I, you've used more and more over the years. And it sounds like there was a lack of clarity, maybe not only with you, but with the people that, that hired you. So I'm hearing that as a problem. And I'm also hearing a lack of, of sponsorship or, or support yeah. for you, right? So here, yeah. we're going to ask this person to go in and be a change agent. And we're going to ask them to step into a situation where there's somebody already there who has their own turf and their own style. Yeah. And, and that requires kind of an extraordinary level of, of having your back right. in, in that sort of a situation. Is that part of what was missing for you? Absolutely. And and I will say, and I'm very fortunate to be able to say this, but that this opportunity was the first time in my career in over 25 years that I didn't have a connection with any of the leaders that I had at this organization over the three years. Yeah. Okay. Let's stop. Let's stop right there because that's, that's such a critical point. I, yes. I was going to ask you if this had ever happened to you. Oh yeah. It never had. No. So you didn't have a connection with them. So Break that down a little bit for me and tell me what that means. Connection to me is that we are engaging on a regular basis, that there is two-way trust and two-way honest communication, that I can feel empowered to move things forward and know this person has my back. And that person knows that I'm going to see what's coming and I'm going to keep them ahead of the game on this, mm -hmm. that I'm going to deliver anything and everything that needs to get delivered, that I'm going to make the tough decisions and do it in a professional way. And I'm going to be a steward of the company on their behalf. You know, Marcus Buckingham, one of the most widely read writers in the business world, yeah, he says, for example, people don't want feedback as much as they just want people to pay attention to them, right? And to know where they are and who they are. And that, that, that simple idea of connection is much more important than any sort of formality in the relationship, right? So uh, right. these people didn't get that is what I'm hearing. Yeah, they didn't. And for me, the basis of that is me giving them kind of my plan of how to move things forward and making sure that we're aligned. And what I found when I went to this company, I onboarded myself. I didn't even have a conversation the first six or eight weeks with my boss that hired me in. So I immediately went to work and started getting to know the teams I was going to be working with in this other area. The other thing I was up against is one of the, the manager that I was hired in over who had just gotten into leadership maybe three or four months earlier, had fancied himself getting my role. Mm -hmm. And there was a disconnect between our leader and kind of where he was. So there was probably resentment coming in. He was he was kind, but he ended up being a very manipulative, subversive type of person. What happens in that situation, Vicki, is that if there is a lack of clarity in that situation, the person who didn't get the job will often retreat into a very passive aggressive modality to kind of reclaim their their power, even though they can't claim it you know, institutionally or, or through title, they still want to reclaim their power. Everybody says the greatest fear that human beings have is heights or sp public speaking. The biggest fear that human beings have is loss of status. So all of a sudden you come in and all kinds of people's status alarms go off that they're, they're going to lose status because you're here now. So, so how do you overcome that? I like to get in into any new leadership situation and you know, establish trust as much as possible. And that's aligning my words with my actions. And what ends up happening with me, and it always does, and it's especially with men, I'll just be super honest. You know, I'm, I'm a gregarious personality. I love, to, you know, I find humor in things. I can yuck it up with the best of them, you know, and people always will test. They will test how, how much can I get away with here? She's nice. She engages. She smiles. I think that I can get away with quite a lot here. They always test it. And then they hit that boundary and they're like, whoa, that is a solid boundary. 
<laughs> and so it's this back and forth. They see that as a potential weakness for them oh, yeah. to exploit? Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. You know, the culture at that particular organization, just to go into it a little bit more, it was like they really, you know, encouraged everybody to challenge each other, which I am all about. I love good, healthy challenge and debate. Like, that's what we're there for. We're not there to just go and never be questioned. I love that. I can do that all day. But when you're dealing with a group, so the average age of the employee in this company was 27. Mm -hmm. We had a ton of just fresh grads out of college that are software engineers. And they, you know, there isn't I mean, I'll say it. I'm an old woman in this industry <laughs> in my mid 40s. It's like, get me a cane. She's starting yeah. to smell. She's that yeah. old. I mean, it's just that's the problem. And so I'm like, so that by itself was like, my God, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? And it quickly became clear that they needed the maturity and the experience because the bulk of the employees didn't have that. But what you also get in those situations in a culture where that is encouraged and fostered is a bunch of people that don't know how to do and challenge appropriately. There's a very fine line between challenging and debating and polarizing. When I hear that sort of a comment, my brain goes in two different directions, right? Because when we challenge, and I, I'm known as a pretty challenging individual myself, but I'm a guy, so maybe that it makes it a little easier for me. I, I don't know. But there's responsibility on both sides of that equation, right? Both sides mm -hmm. of that relationship. There's responsibility to challenge effectively, and there's also responsibility to be challenged mm -hmm. effectively. Absolutely. And so when I hear that people say they want to be challenged, but they don't really want to be challenged, that always shows up for me that, oh, wow, there's a gift, there's a maturity in learning to challenge effectively, but you also shouldn't have to be so damn careful either, right? This has been frustrating for me throughout my career sure. is, geez, can I just say what I want to say and not have everybody running for the exits? And I agree with that to the point, but the, the reality in the workplace today, Jim, is people are very, very sensitive. And so when you do challenge in a way that it, it could even be down to the individual, I'll take onus in that. It wasn't just me gristling about these different individuals in these kind of challenges. They would have the ear of senior leadership and be like, I'm going to challenge this. And yet they were absolutely aggressive and nasty to people that weren't that senior leader, right? A bully is what they ended up being. And it was fostered because that senior leader wasn't ever present in those conversations. You know, I had a conversation with a VP and one of his principals, and this guy is so aggressive and coming at me. And he's like, you look me in this camera and you tell me you don't have my solution. And da, da, da. I mean, he mm -hmm. is pointing at me. Yeah. Power tripping. He's, he's yep. totally. Yep. And my boss is in there. His boss is in there. They're not saying anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I back him down and and his boss is smiling. So we get off that call. This guy's clearly a loose cannon. Normally, I would have hashed it out with him and said, don't ever talk to me that way again. But I knew it would escalate. So I went to his leader because I also needed to talk to his leader about his behavior. And I said, listen, I don't allow people to talk to me that way. I don't allow it in my personal life. And I really don't allow it in my professional life. Get him reined in or this is going to escalate very quickly. And I know you need him. And I said, furthermore, I don't appreciate your behavior in that meeting as you're smiling and amused by his behavior. And he goes, oh, oh, I was smiling because I was uncomfortable. So you <laughs> okay. knew there was a situation and yep. you did nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of that's just one of many of those types of examples. Yeah, a couple of things here. And thanks for sharing that. I mean, it's I, I, that's probably a story that a lot of people who are listening can relate to. Relate to. Um, <laughs> yeah. Accountability is is kind of a central tentpole for the organization. It kind of holds everything up. If you're engaging somebody with somebody who's not being held accountable by their boss, then that makes it very difficult for you. Now, I can imagine a scenario in which going to directly to the person might have worked, but I, I heard some pretty combative language from you in this conversation 
that would have made me concerned about how you would have approached that person about that issue. I mean, you know, so. I would have made it very clear. And because of how aggressively he came at me in that conversation, it would have escalated for sure. Okay. I can only trust that that's true, that there would have been no way to go to that person and say, listen, I was very uncomfortable in that conversation. I mean, when you address an issue like that, you absolutely have to own what you're feeling. All you can really comment on in any situation is how you felt. You can't put any right. thoughts or intentions into the other person's mind. You just can't do that. I get that you got defensive and I get that you wanted to fight back. Is there any concern I ha- I should have about the way that you approach that? If you don't mind me asking. I don't, I was clear. I was, I mean, I think it was validated when his leader said I was uncomfortable right. and that's why he was smirking. Yeah. And there were other people in there that were witness to the behavior that had the same feelings. Because I checked with them for feedback afterwards Mm -hmm. and said, listen, did I misread that? They're like, what was going on? What was happening? And I assume this wasn't an isolated circumstance that this person. No, it ends up this person. And I even said that I'm like, I'm sure I'm not the first person to come to you. Because this is the first time I had ever met this guy. I had never met him or worked with him prior. Yeah, so he was just pissing on his fire hydrant, mm-hmm. letting you know who, who was in charge, right? Yeah. Those are difficult people to deal with. Sometimes the bully can be defused pretty quickly if somebody stands up to them, right? I mean, this is kind of the rule about bullies is they'll be bullies as long as they get away with it. But if their boss wasn't willing to take action on it and their response was to It was to be uncomfortable and not do anything about it. That's pretty tragic leadership right there. So you've used. Yeah, my boss was in there too and didn't do anything about it. So, I mean, it just, yeah, it just speaks to the bigger thing. Yeah, yeah. So you've used the word culture a lot in this conversation. And, you know, I appreciate that because it is so essential to our experience at work. Now that that you've had this experience and you walk into a a new environment, Mm-hmm. What are some of the cultural things you're you're looking for? How would you describe a really positive culture? Culture is a big word, and I just I like to break it down when I can. Yeah, and I just did this through a job search. So when I left that company, eventually I took nine months off, mm-hmm. and so when I was doing my job search, that's exactly what I was sussing out. Which is, is it a culture of feedback and safety and not duplicate the mistake I made. Figuring out if they find certain people so valuable that those people get away with anything and everything, or is everybody expected to show up as professionals and engage in a way that is productive? And so I I dug into that on my job search. How did you do that? Clearly, the the extended interview process with the previous employer raised some concerns with you. Were you right. are, are you able to find out what you need to find out in that in that process to make that decision? Number one, I expressed what I needed mm-hmm. right in my leaders and what I desired in that dynamic. What characteristics I need in a leader that I'm gonna you know connect with. The fact that I've had experiences where that wasn't that great and that it wasn't something that I could sustain. Like I was very honest in that process. Well, because the relationship between you and your future boss is so important, I think a lot of people would probably have a lot to learn from you in regard to uh, how you're going about making these choices. That whole experience has had lasting effects. Yeah. It it has set me up in my new role to... I have a lot of trepidation. Mm. It's like I'm, I'm um, lost a little bit of your mojo. Oh, for sure. And Mm. what it really called out for me, Jim, is that my work came in way too much on my self-worth versus who I am as a human being, who Vicky shows up day in and day out as a spouse, as, Mm. you know, all of these different things. Taking a hit there impacted me greatly. I broke trust with myself by not listening to my gut that has never failed me. Mm. I allowed my ego and my pride to take over there because it was getting fed. And I hurt myself very, very dearly. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, we're all sensitive in terms of our sense of ourself. I love that you use the word trusting and trust in yourself because there's a lot of evidence that your ability to trust others 
it comes directly from your your self trust level. I mean, if right. you if you can't trust yourself, then you quite naturally have to project out on the world that other people are as, as untrustworthy as I am with myself. So you kind of have to learn to trust again. Exactly. Even in this new role that is just this really wonderful company with a wonderful mission. And I love my entire team and I love how culturally diverse it is. And, you know, I always have to remind myself, it's like, check, check the motivations and intent here. There's zero bad. There's nobody's trying to manipulate you right now. Nobody's trying to shame you. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'm getting better and better as I'm getting more settled in for sure. But it's going to be a journey. Yeah. After that last bad experience, I thought about getting out completely. I'm like, maybe you just don't fit here anymore. Maybe it has changed so much that you don't have impact here anymore and you need to rethink, you know. And and then I thought, well, I could go maybe try to be an individual contributor or something. And I'm like, geez, I'm not even, I, I don't qualify for that anymore. You're in an age where those kinds of questions frequently come up. I'm significantly older than you, but I can remember very much being 47. Yeah. And whether it was through that type of experience or not, I think it's a time in your life when you naturally start to ask some of those questions. That's reassuring. That's super helpful because (laughs) I, I attributed to this horrible experience. And the other thing I struggle with, I have this many years of leadership experience and I'm not in a director role. So you feel like you haven't advanced as much as you you should? Well, I don't know that I want to. This mm-hmm. is the struggle for me is I mm-hmm. have these outside forces saying, you have so much experience. You've done a director job at other companies. It just wasn't called that. Why aren't you going for the bigger title, more money, all of these things? And it's been a struggle for me because I am not the person that wants to just go up and up. I have to enjoy the people that I work with and what I do every day. A metaphor that I've been using with people recently is is I, I talk about this heavy duty driving capitalist system that we live in, and the, the, there's no greater example of hard driving capitalism than the tech industry. The metaphor I've come up with is at a pretty early age. In your case, it was 19. Somebody walks you up to like this gigantic river, this really fast flowing river, and they say, "If you want to be a success." You got to jump in the river and the river is powerful, but it's, it's what you have to do to be successful. If you want to make money and you want to have a house and you want to, you know, go take European vacations, you got to jump in the damn river, right? And what happens is a lot of people jump in the river and then they can't get out. They get into the faster flowing parts of that river and they, they're looking to grab a branch or something to get the hell out of that because they just don't want to be in that river anymore. And right. there's other people who love it, right? And they just, they don't want it to ever end. But it's hard to get out of that river. It's hard to say, I don't want to be the boss. I don't want to be the, the director. It is. I just want a really good job that I care about. But there's, there is judgment about that. It's so sad, but there still is judgment about that. Well, and I feel like this current company is developing me in that way, mm-hmm. too. And it's like, if you say, you know what, I'm good here, you're seen as having a lack of ambition. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. It's really struggling up against my own values around what do I want? If I'm going to work, if I'm going to do this every day, I want to be really as close to the tech as possible and working on really cool things and, you know, delivering amazing results. And that feels good to me. Yeah, I understand that at a certain point, The crap associated with hierarchical advancement uh, (laughs) might not be much of a motivator anymore if you've had those titles and you've had, you know, VP position or whatever. Mm -hmm. That may be less important to you as you get older and more advanced in your career than just being a a difference maker and actually being able to uh, get things done and, and, and do the work that you really enjoy. Right. I'm just releasing a book called Stepping Up or Stepping Aside, which is all about this journey of hierarchical advancement and deciding whether we want to continue that or whether we want to step aside and and find a different role in our company. But it doesn't mean you won't be a leader. No. You want to be a leader either, either way. I can hear that very strongly with you, that you still want to influence, you still want to lead, but maybe some of the other 
uh, crap that we deal with in organization and politics is of no interest for you anymore. I mean, this is just self-work that I need to continue to do to be okay. It's like really driving to what I want to do. And Mm -hmm. there are director roles in certain companies that I'd love to have. And then there's ones that I probably would not because it distances me too much. It isn't to me, I'm capable. It isn't a capabilities issue. Yeah. I don't hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, what am I going to enjoy? Are you doing enough in your personal life to fill some of those gaps? I mean, I, I'm on two nonprofit boards now, for example, and that's filled some of that gap for me. I'll share just a very personal thing, but I'm a recovering alcoholic. You know, I do a lot of service Mm -hmm. work around that. I also live on a farm and I have horses and I have dogs. I don't have children. My husband and I were like, we're we're blissfully child free, but. (laughs) More and more people are joining you in that. Yeah, right. Right. (laughs) You know, I love kids, but it's just, you know, so in building up this farm, designing how everything's going, the health of my family, I'm like, that's where you need to derive your worth from. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I've had to actively seek out other ways to to derive that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. The struggle with alcohol. Does that mm-hmm. play into the trust issue we talked about? Yes. Yes. And but what it also does, Jim, is you know, when you work a program, you're required to be a different human being. You don't get the luxury of showing up for excuse my language and to be an asshole. You don't get that luxury anymore. You need to show up. You need to be a decent human being. If you are not, you need to atone for that. And you need to behave differently if you are going to stay sober. And so I take that really seriously. Um, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but, and it's funny too, because all of us (laughs) that are in recovery, there's specific language we use and I'll hear somebody else and I'm like, Oh, and you know, we find each other in the workplace because most of us don't, don't readily talk about it. It's, it's dangerous to talk about it. It's stigma. There's a lot of stigma around it. And I have years of sobriety. And, and so that's been a tricky thing to navigate in the workplace where it's like, I've shown up to a company day one and they have alcohol everywhere in the office, open bottles of liquor and let's take a shot to celebrate you joining. And I'm like, nope. I recently had a a health setback. It's not a big deal, but I can't drink alcohol or I can only drink very, very small amounts of alcohol. And I'm already finding a lot of discomfort in social situations because of that. And I I think employers probably need to be a little more sensitive about that. It's a problem. And it took me a while. They had pressured me enough because certainly I didn't want to open up about that on day one. Right. There has to be a lot of trust established for me to say, hey, this is how I live my life. But I finally just said, listen, I don't drink. Okay. I lost my screen time. I was privileged years ago. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> They're like, oh, got it. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it's not being that big of a deal. I hope you can give yourself credit for, you know, what you, what you have accomplished. Yeah. I, and I do feel good about that. And I have a lot of relationships that have maintained over the years that, you know, are very fulfilling as a result of leadership. That's a good sign that you've given a lot of yourself. And yeah, yeah, that's great. (laughs) Yeah. What's the number one challenge for you moving forward from a leadership perspective? I think it is just reestablishing that trust in myself. You know, to your point, starting there will allow more trust for others. How do you do that? I think it's building blocks for me. It's little things of taking risks and taking chances and seeing how things land And being open to the feedback around that and being able to change and pivot and do that, like work my way through those situations. You've been just lovely to talk to and and I've enjoyed it very, very, very much. And thank you for everything you shared. I'm sure a lot of people listening will, will have a lot of value to pull out of this conversation. So thanks very much. Great. It was a pleasure, Jim. Thank you. All right. Take care. I, I have my own set of takeaways from the conversation I've just had with Vicki. I think what really has nested in with me about that conversation is just this person's journey. She acknowledged a, a problem with alcohol. She acknowledged an issue with, with reaching a difficult stage in her career. 
reeling, in a sense, from a negative experience with a previous job. And I, I admire her for her resilience and, you know, getting back up and, and moving forward. But you can see that she's at an age and a time in her career where she's been maybe wounded a little bit or, or she's questioning maybe the assumptions that, that she had about her career aren't playing out exactly the way she might have expected them to. And I guess, you know, being the age that I am, you know, I get my first Social Security check next month. I just want you to know, that, you know, that's normal. That's the, when you go through a long career, you're going to have stops and starts and you're going to have times when you run into the wall and you're going to have times when you have to question a lot of the assumptions you've made about your career and, and, and even about who you are. And I, I guess I just want to say that when those times come to try to embrace them as much as you can, I went through a devilishly difficult time in my late 40s, or around the same time that Vicki was describing her challenges. And I came out it just in a, in a much better place. But the only reason I was able to come out in a better place is because I confronted head-on what was going on there. I didn't shy away from it. I didn't try to pretend that I wasn't struggling. I acknowledged, especially to the people who love me, that I was struggling. And I I heard that Vicki has some work to do, like all of us, to kind of decide what she wants the rest of her life to to be and, and to look like. And also to recognize that whatever she thinks that is now might change another five or ten years down the road, and that's okay. So I was very honored by Vicki, the strength of her character and how the, the work that she's doing. We often talk amongst ourselves about whether our clients are willing to do the work. It's a term we use a lot. And Vicki is clearly willing to do the work and is, is actively doing the work. And I think she's going to be just fine because of that. Well, thank you for listening to Path Forward, Real Conversations About Leadership. If you enjoyed this episode, really appreciate it if you let us know. You can rate and review the show on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. Special thanks to all my guests for the level of vulnerability they took in sharing their stories. If you'd like to be a guest on Path Forward, please reach out via the contact form on my website, pathforwardleadership.com. That's also where you can learn more about our show, my upcoming book, and my leadership services. This episode is produced by Large Media. You can find them at larjmedia.com. As always, thank you for listening. I'm Jim Hessler, and this is Path Forward.